Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the September 24th um, Planning Commission meeting. If you'd all follow me in the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we'll go to our roll call, please. Uh, Mr. Sevison. Mr. Gray is absent. Mr. Moss? Here. Mr. Johnson? Here. Mr. Nader? Here. Mr. Ricucci? Here. Mr. Denial? Here. Okay, we'll have our report. EJ? Planning Services Division. Uh, I, all I have is a few calendaring items to go uh, over, and then we can probably get on with the meeting today. Uh, our next meeting, we're looking at canceling. That's October 8th. So if you can put that on your calendar. No meeting. No meeting on October 8th. Uh, the second meeting in October is October 22nd. We will have a meeting here in Auburn. Uh, we have an extension of time on that agenda right now, and then also a uh, zoning text amendment regarding sec secondary dwelling units. Uh, Looking into November, I'm going to go out because we have a lot of projects that are starting to line up right now. So at the November 5th meeting, uh, that will also be in Auburn. Uh, tentatively, we have the Bickford Ranch project that's going to be ready to come before you. Uh, we're actually trying to get that to the Horseshoe Bar Penryn Mac uh, at a special meeting in October. And uh, you know, we'll bring their recommendation to you uh, in, at the November 5th meeting. Rancho del Oro, uh, that project, if you remember, is, uh, continues to move forward. However, uh, they've submitted an extension of time request uh, to, to keep that project moving. So that will be on November 5th. And then uh, the winery ordinance, not sure exactly when that's going to come. We're trying to get that done before the end of the year. Uh, that would be our, our hope. Uh, we, we've met with the, uh, the Sierra Club folks once again, or Marilyn Jasper. Uh, we're also meeting with the Vintners one more time just to see where everybody's at before we bring it back to you for consideration. And then November 19th, we're looking at a Tahoe meeting, hopefully before uh, winter begins, <laughs> preferably. It's going to start. Subject, subject to snow. So right now we're penciled in for uh, the North Tahoe Conference Room in Kings Beach. Uh, the, the big thing we're going up there for is the Martis Valley West project. Their draft EIR is going to be released in mid-October, and so that, that will be a uh, draft EIR public hearing to accept comments on that document. Uh, we also uh, will be hearing an appeal on the North Star Basin retrofit project, which uh, was part of the uh, North Star master plan and the forest flyer. Uh, there was a grading permit attached to that, and that grading permit has, that was approved by the county to fix that detention basin is now being appealed, and that will be coming before your, before your commission. So things are getting pretty busy as we get towards the end of the year, which is typical, uh, but we'll try to get these uh, on the agenda so you guys can take some action. Just yes, for information's sake, uh, we had TRPA yesterday for 12 days in a row, it seemed like. <laughs> It was the longest meeting we've ever had, I think. And it was regard the the issue that took all the time, of course, was the Martis it's actually called Brockway Campground. Right, and that's that piece that was pulled off on the on the lake side as part well, of the project. We absolutely filled the place in all of adjacent rooms with TVs and microphones and stuff. It went on and on and on. We must have had a huge audience. And I would have to say that uh, there's not much support for it. <laughs> if I counted noses yesterday, I just, by comment, we didn't vote, but just right. attitude, I'd say they're not going to. And I believe the county does have an application in on that now, an official application, so we'll be processing that, but that will be processed separate from the Mart Martis Valley West project. Yeah. They, uh, that came up, they said that, People were asking, well, what's the disposition of the original application for the home sites that was on that? Remember, there, originally the first application was for home right, sites. Correct. Well, uh, 
when they asked about it, they said it's been suspended. Well, that didn't answer the question that they wanted to. <laughs> so I guess we need to talk about the suspension and what does it mean and how does it work and is it, it doesn't mean a withdrawal, it just means you just put it on the back burner, I assume, and so uh, that may become an issue too. Okay. Just for your information, I'm just trying to enlighten. Larry, did uh, Squaw Valley come up? Oh, it came up. Uh, there was a handful of people there talking about that. Uh, obviously not nearly the numbers because it wasn't really on the agenda very much, but it, it was, there was just a, the whole world is opposed to anything else happening in their backyard, and so it's just the way it is. I, just, and I don't know what you do about it, but uh, it was pretty intense. Are they still pushing TRPA to weigh in? Oh, yeah, yeah, and Martis Valley, too. They want TRP to weigh in on Martis Valley, and and, and I don't, I, of course, I don't think there's a desire to weigh in on it other than traffic and, and air quality items and things like that, which uh, I think could, can, and maybe will be mitigated in both cases, but I don't know that... Uh, or attempted to be mitigated, it may never satisfy everyone. Uh, but there's, there's, there's a lot of bridges to cross to get through all that. It's too bad it all came up right at the same time that we're still working on the basin plan because it prejudices it pretty badly. <laughs> Sorry to... No, it's all, it's all good information. Uh, obviously, both contentious projects, and I think when we have the draft EIR hearing in November, we're going to hear a lot more about probably both of them. So. I, also, I just got approached about ag preserves. Are we having trouble processing them now? Uh, no, we're, we still, Williamson Act program is still alive in the county. And, uh, you know, typically this time of year is when the requests come in for new, for new contracts uh, or renewals. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of business as usual. We have, one, we have one request down in Granite Bay right now uh, for a cancellation of Ag Preserve that will be coming before your commission. That's something, I'm not sure if the county's ever done one. If, if Yeah, just off the top of my head, I'm not sure if we've ever canceled a, a Ag contract. Well, I just was approached in the parking lot by a, an old friend who wants to put several pieces in Ag Preserve, and he was told by the staff that it could, we're just so backed up we can't get to it and do it right away or something to that effect. That doesn't sound right. I'll well, let's talk about it. Yeah, later. let me yeah let me know the, the name and I can look into Bert that. Lefty. Oh, Alex's son. Oh, Bert. Yeah. Yeah, we, we can uh, happy to check into that. I mean, you have to meet certain criteria obviously to establish an ag preserve, uh, but anyway, we can yeah we can talk about I'm that not, offline. I'm not sure what all the what he asked. You know, like, we're really anxious to get it. No, 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 they said we can't do it right away, so I don't know. I just thought it was... Right, happy, happy to look into it. <laughs> Thank so you. So just, just one last item as far as the Board of Supervisors hearings. Uh, the uh, Pantel Stafford minor boundary line adjustment appeal that you heard last month, uh, that has been appealed now to the Board of Supervisors. So Michael Garabedi and on behalf of the, uh, I believe, the Friends of the North Fork uh, filed an appeal, and so that will be scheduled uh, before the end of the year at the Board. And that's all I have on that oh. note. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> okay, at this you time... Eat up too bad yesterday? <laughs> I'll open it up to public comment. If um, anybody from the public wants to speak on any item that's not on today's agenda, now is your opportunity to speak. Seeing none, we'll... Go ahead to our, um, well, we don't, normally it's consent agenda, but there's no Idiots. consent items for this hearing, so we don't have to worry about that. So we'll go to our first, um, first item, Peak 10 Residential Redevelopment Vesting Tentative Subdivision Map Conditional Use Permit um, and Mitigated Negative Declaration. Okay. Ready. Alan? You got it. Thank you. Um, this is, as mentioned, it's the Peak 10 Residential Redevelopment Project. It is in Kings Beach. It is for a vesting tentative subdivision map, conditional use permit to allow a planned residential development 
that will consist of up to 10 single family airspace condominium units. There is, as part of the entitlements, there is a variance to the parking requirements to allow 20 spaces in lieu of the 31. To get everyone oriented where it is, it isn't directly in the heart of Kings Beach. This is the event center, is right here. The existing structure is called Sun and Sand. It has 27 uh, tourist accommodation units and one caretaker unit. This is Brockway Vista. It's a road uh, right away, but it's a paper road. There's no improvements. The asphalt stops about right here. This is also part of the project, is a beach parcel. Um, there's some correspondence in your packet from CTCs, the California Tile Conservancy. We've been talking to them as well. There is an easement that goes over this parcel here. So the project basically would be demoing the sun and sand building and then building the 10 condominium units known as the Peak 10. This is what the site looks like right now with the buildings. Sun and Sand, obviously, there's a, the core improvements that's happening right out in front. Part of the conditioning, too, that we're recommending to the commission is the community plan improvements, which is undergrounding the utility reds. So those are in the Brockway Vista right away. The site is pretty impactive. Uh, it has a lot of asphalt, uh, no BMPs. So this particular project staff reviewed with Peak 10, there, there will be quite a significant amount of BMP work. So the proposal, the applicant, uh, when they came and talked to us, was to use the exact same footprint, basically, of what's out there today. And they'd be using the parking area here. So with the 20 spaces being proposed that's coming in at this location, uh, staff agreed that, you know, that the parking made sense to us because of the 20, it'd be two parking spaces per unit, which is typical for single family development in the, in the Tao area. So these being condominium, separately owned, staff agreed that uh, we can limit through CCNRs as well, uh, specifically that each unit have two spaces. But this is the layout, and it's better than what was out there before, too. Initially, when staff started doing our review, uh, you know, turn around, making sure fire department was okay with what uh, was proposed, which they are. Um, and then maintaining the view corridors that you get out towards the lake, and I'll show you a snapshot of that. This is an angle of the new building that's going in. It's, it is one building. This is looking from the lake location. This is the event center. And part of the discussion, too, that you do see in your packet, we did receive a letter um, from uh, Megan. Uh, she indicated the concerns maybe of the future community plan update, how this particular project would, would uh, be allowed. Staff did review that, and there was a lot of feedback from the community of having the higher density in the core area of Kings Beach, uh, that being residential as well, uh, to allow people to live, work, and play there um, so they can walk to their businesses as necessary. Um, so we did review as part of the focus group to see if some of these concepts, what exactly was gonna be looked at out, out in the Kings Beach area. That was something that uh, staff did review, even though it's not necessary with our current plan. Our current plan does allow this use by a conditional use permit in our 1996 uh, Kings Beach community plan. And you can see here is the, um, the overheads that will go underground. Uh, you do have in your packet as well, there's significant amount of signatures of the community in general uh, in support of the project, and those being the adjacent property owners as well. And this is the, the view, what it's going to look like when it's, uh, when it's built. And then this is the view corridors that will be maintained. The trees, the applicant, when we talk to them, they are maintaining the, the trees that are there as well. There'll be no removal of the trees. So they had very limited area to construct. And after review and getting feedback, uh, staff is recommending you know, approval of this particular project. Uh, we are recommending to adopt the mitigated neg deck, approve the vesting tentative subdivision map, a conditional use permit to allow up to the 10 single family residential airspace condominium units, and approve the variance to allow 20. There is an errata sheet you should have as well. Um, part of the errata basically is again to emphasize what CTC has provided feedback to us. 
they have that beach par parcel. They wanted to ensure maybe in the future if they want to have uh, something there at that location. So the, the errata is showing just that parcel number for the sun and sand parcel. There were some clarifications on the BMP, and then the last one there too was the, the timing, because it is a, a tentative vesting map, so we have to make sure that 36 months is in there. So there's three changes that staff is recommending to the Planning Commission as well. And I have, any questions? Alan, uh, you mentioned that, the, I think you said the fire agency has approved uh, the access in and, and the ability to turn in there. Yes. If, if I saw the plan right, it looked like space number 20 was kind of over in that corner. And I right. wondered if that would impede kind of turn, using that as a turn area if there was a vehicle in that, in that corner over there. Yeah, we, same, when staff reviewed it as well, um, we were considering that, and then we had fire department come back to us and they said they could serve it. Um, and our, we could have done is remove that space and said, you know, for maybe coming in this way, or, and even too, something we had to consider was the snow removal as well. Where is that gonna be piled up and because there's minimal parking. So there, they've, the applicant has told us there's gonna be a contract, they're gonna be shipping that snow out. So basically, when it's snowing heavily, they're going to have uh, removal of that snow to go off site. Um, but good, good question. We, we were thinking the same thing, but then we thought because of the variance constraints, we wanted to ensure there was two spaces per unit. Well, I guess if the fire agency is okay with it, that's yes. fine, but it sure looks tight to me. I don't know how they can turn uh, a fire apparatus in that. It's almost like they have to go in and then back out because uh, right. it just looks too tight. Right. Well, they do have part of the the fire marshal was indicating too. It was because it was sprinkler of this building, um, so any anything going you know crazy at that location, uh, the larger vehicles won't be there. Some of the thing questions we had was an ambulance being able to go in there quickly right. and and getting what they need to, and then fire did say they would be able to serve it. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought I saw in the package maybe from a comment from the from one of the uh, citizens that that there's uh, non-complying uh, setbacks there, and I didn't see a variance or anything that's covering that so I just wondered what that's all about. That's a good question. Um, we did have to look at the existing um, building. There is some non-conforming setbacks so basically they're building within the same footprint so they have some non-conforming rights basically on those setbacks. Um, because one of the key things, too, typically for setback, because this is even though it's a paper road, we'd have to look at that as a front setback. Mm -hmm. And because they've had existing uh, conditions that are there now, they were allowed to maintain those, that, that would be acceptable to staff. Okay. That's just because they're using the same footprint, is what you're saying? Yes, that's correct. And the conditional use permit, too, as mentioned in the staff report, will memorialize those setbacks. Um, there is, the, there is a deck, you know, as part of the um, criteria too, but again, because this is not a uh, future road, we're not looking at a front setback on that. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me. What, what's the availability of off-site parking? The, in the Kings Beach Core project, we do have construction of uh, public parking around the area, and we're still aggressively doing that as part of the core project. Um, but those are first come, first serve. They're not reserved for, like for projects, or, for example. But we are trying to maintain whatever uh, parking that was removed as part of the core that we're trying to provide parking off-site. Um, so they have ind independent uh, parking spaces. Actually, there's one pretty close by. It's up, I think it's up in here. Can't really see it. But that's a fairly recent as part of the mitigation for the core project because there was street parking being removed. Where would we put additional parking? But again, they're not they're not reserved for any project though. First come, first serve. But it is it 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 it's existing now or this is Yes, it's existing now, but there's some other projects that we are in the process of constructing too. Maybe one more question. Just uh, in the past we've had some fairly contentious meetings regarding the Falcon, and this is not no. the Falcon, is it? No, uh, the Falcon is, that's Dave Ferrari's, here's the Falcon right here. Yeah. Okay. Pretty close by, but there's, there's a restaurant at this location right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. 
Right. And then I do oh, have the applicant just, here. Uh, another question on parking. Sure. Uh, yes. And this may not be something that the uh, county would dictate, but it's since we're making a concession on the parking spaces, it seems like we're opening the opportunity for a chaotic situation of people saying, hey, you know, somebody's using my parking, using more of their parking spaces than they should, you know, their allotment of two. Has they, have they talked about having designated parking? Yeah, and they actually they want to discuss parking a little bit more in detail. Um, I will let you know they, they did approach staff about one of the errata sheets there about the two, about no boat parking. So they're going to discuss that a little bit further to you uh, about maybe some changes there. But there is conditions of approval in that we're suggesting to the Planning Commission, CCNRs. So we would look at their CCNRs, the, the applicants, and see how they're going to limit the parking there, making sure it is two per unit and how that's maintained and enforced. Um, so we have to make sure that those two spaces are there is why we're recommending a variance to their parking. Okay, thank you, Alan. Thank you. And then okay, at this time, would the applicant or his representative like to come up and speak? Okay, good morning. My name is Andrew Ryan. I'm representing the Peak 10 Project. I, am, uh, I live and work in Kings Beach, and we have other project representatives with us today, and I just wanted to point to them real quick, our, our team over here. First is Bill Johnson. He's a longtime Kings Beach resident as well. He's been the broker and land development consultant. He's also a general engineering contractor. Next is the investor, Todd Davidson. He lives in Incline. And then we have the architect team of Peter DiMatte on the right, or your left, and Dale Cox on the right. So let's see. Uh-oh, I think I hit the wrong button. So I do have a presentation, but what I think I'll do is just go through, uh, I won't repeat anything that Alan covered with you, but I will pick up on some of the questions that you have, and if you have questions for me that are further, I, I can certainly answer those. So it is an existing motel. It was built in 1953. Uh, most of the Kings Beach buildings in downtown Kings Beach are circa 1950s, 1960s. We haven't had a significant redevelopment project in town in the last two decades, about 20 years. Uh, since private investment has built a new building. You may remember the Domus affordable housing buildings. Those were a joint project, Placer County, the developer, and there was tax increment funding there. So the existing motel is 27 tourist accommodation units, one existing residential unit. It has 20 parking stalls and is more or less the same configuration as we're proposing. Alan showed you the pictures. Uh, one thing I wanted to note was that uh, in, the, in the top view, this is the existing condition. The beach is, is completely open and will remain open. We're not proposing any improvements there. And this is the existing structure of the sun and sand. Right now, due to the way that they park, which is diagonal, and then parallel along the fence between them and steamers, the view shed from the highway is very narrow because of the structures. As part of the proposed project, since we're slightly changing the parking configuration and having everyone pull in forward under the decks and we're doing a low deck at the front, we vastly improved the view shed and you can see that in our renderings. So we, we see a nice improvement there. In terms of the, the parking and access, something else that happens with the Kings Beach Commercial Core is that the travel lane gets moved away from the first parking stall. There's a planter that the Kings Beach Commercial Corps installs, and then we'll have a planter as well next door. So we get some landscape on an area right now that is all asphalt. It's highway asphalt building. So we'll be able to get some nice landscape improvements there. That's a perspective rendering of what the units will look like. Uh, they are three stories, but they meet the TRPA height requirement. The TRPA height requirement is 34 feet, one inch. I think we go to 34 feet and five eighths, right? We're right there, but we meet it. And it will be three stories and everyone gets a deck. And the pop-out structure here, all the windows angle towards the lake. So even the last unit does get a piece of lake view as well. It's another version of the site plan, floor plans, and then colored elevation views. We recently just attended the North Tahoe Design Review Committee where we 
received a unanimous recommendation for approval to your body, and we discussed both the elevations, the renderings, and the scenic quality in detail. Uh, quickly, our, our goals. Uh, the main genesis for this project is to, to help be a catalyst and show that redevelopment in Kings Beach is possible. Uh, we have some environmental goals as well. We're going to reduce coverage by 10%. The density of the units is going down. We're bringing the opportunity to live and have a residence in the downtown. There's a reduction because of that land use change on vehicle miles traveled, 62 or 63% reduction in vehicle miles traveled. Part of that is because we have a bus stop right out front. We have dining right next door, shopping across the street, and a large supermarket within less than a half mile. We've been over some of the viewshed improvements and the scenic quality. And even though the parking is tight, and we acknowledge that, we do recognize that, we are improving upon the existing condition. All vehicles can now leave in a head out manner. Previously, because of the parallel parking, vehicles were backing out onto highway. So they would actually back out into highway 28 before proceeding forward. With our arrangement, they can all back up and pull and leave in a head out manner. We will be doing drainage and water quality improvements as well, and hopefully improving the town center vibrancy. Quickly, we do meet all of the codes of the current plan area statement. So that means we meet density, we meet height. Uh, we do have the parking variance. Life safety, uh, you guys touched on that, and I'd just like to add what FIRE said was, right now, we have tourist accommodation units functioning in a substandard building in terms of life safety. So the existing motel does not have a sprinkler system. It does not have adequate egress on the windows. And it is a tight site as well. FIRE, what they communicated to us was that a new modern building with current codes, FIRE sprinkler systems, and the newly installed hydrant that's just next door at the event center is a great improvement in their view, and that they can deal with the narrow access. A quick update on our schedule. We're, we're here today for entitlement and use permit. Uh, we will begin demolish, demolition tomorrow if we're successful today. Uh, we do have a couple other permits to gather. We have our improvement plan permit and our building permit, and we hope to complete construction in fall of 2016. I have more renderings and slides that I can walk through if you'd like, or I'm happy to open the floor to questions. I just have one quick question. Sure. Um, um, it's, there are three stories. How many square feet are in each unit, just from this kind of information? So ballpark-wise, yeah, just... there's 10 units. One through nine are essentially the same. There are around 1,550 square feet. There is one unit within those that is universally accessible or ADA accessible. It's slightly larger okay. uh, at about 1,600. The, the unit on the end, the beach unit, is 2,500. Oh. How, how many bedrooms? One through nine are three bedrooms, or actually I should say two through 10 are three bedroom units. The unit one on the lake is a four bedroom. Okay. Yeah, questions? Go ahead. You don't have an elevator with the three stories, I guess. It's all stairways? Correct. Yeah. Um, what happens to, is it Brockway Vista Avenue that dead ends against the, the edge of the property? Yes. So this is to the south. Lake Tahoe is here. Brockway Vista Avenue, and then the development parcel. You, you don't own beyond Brockway Vista Avenue on the lakeside? Well, it, we Isn't do. Isn't there a recreation area you showed? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it is owned. It is part of the project, and it was used for the density calculations. Uh -huh. However, there is a... A recorded easement that the Conservancy bought that allows for public recreation and limits development in that area. No hard surfaces or coverage can be constructed. Oh, okay. I've forgotten about that. <laughs> yeah, well, we've, we've spoken with Lisa O'Daly from the CTC. There is a letter in your packet that she wrote as well. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, what other questions do I have? Uh, so you're not going to try to have any of your traffic go through and out the back side and turn right on, on no we are going to have one in and out here okay all right i noticed it looks like it's fenced off are you getting ready to demolish is that getting close 
Yeah, tomorrow. If we're successful today, pretty close. <laughs> demolition will start tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait till tomorrow, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it's time. It's a time-worn building. It's, yeah, yeah. It, it's ready to come down. Uh, I think that's all the questions I have right now. Thank you. Yeah. Can, can, can you start tomorrow because there's a 10-day appeal period? Uh, well, I mean, the, I mean, the demolition is separate from the use permit and the entitlement oh, oh, today. Okay, okay. I just, yeah. just kind, of, kind of crossed my mind here. Yeah. Not that anybody, I, I expect yeah. anybody to appeal it, but you know. No, no, and we're well, we're well aware of the appeal period. Uh, we are somewhat under the constraints of the building season up there. Right, right. yeah, I was wanting Trying to get in before. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Can you talk a little bit more about parking and the enforcement of parking spaces and use and that kind of thing and how you plan on handling that? Sure. Yeah. We looked we looked long and hard at parking there and and we we took a lot of the comments that we got from staff and others to heart and and I think you know part of talking about parking in Kings Beach you have to at least look to the past a little bit to understand what's going on in Kings Beach. So Way back when, in 1926, when, when they recorded the Brockway subdivision map, the original plan for Kings Beach was 25-foot wide lots, and it's presented a challenge for any redevelopment, a significant challenge for any redevelopment to come to Kings Beach to meet some of those parking and access requirements. So none of us in this room were here in a decision-making capacity when that subdivision was approved, and I think we all need to look at this together and say what's reasonable and what we're proposing we believe is reasonable um, to help solve the parking in Kings Beach in a, in, a, in a good manner. So the existing condition, 28 units, 20 parking stalls. Our proposed condition is 10 units and 10 parking stalls. And within our CCNRs, each spot will be assigned. So there'll be two spots assigned per unit and they will be clearly stated that they do not have additional parking on site. So the variance that we're seeking, how that's been, you know, how we made that comparison is said, what does a single, typical single family home, what are their requirements? They're required two spots. We look to apply that same metric. Uh, we also have the benefit that we're urban infill. We're, we're downtown where Residents can walk next door, like I said, to steamers or dining, walk to across the street to shop as well. Yeah, but what happened if I, if I wanted to come and visit you? If you were living there, where would I be parking? Since I wouldn't have a parking permit or something, just a question. Sure, so I think Alan touched on some of the availability of the Kings Beach lots that are nearby. So there is public parking available there. There is also on-street parking that's available as well. So there's almost right outside the front door availability, and then in the satellite parking, there's availability there. So, so you're gonna like mark each parking spot as you know exclusive use of unit one, and there's two spots. And, Correct. And if Rich goes up there, he can only visit somebody that has one vehicle if he wants to park in front of the place. Is that it, Rich? Well, yeah, if, if, if I came up and visited somebody and they, they said, okay, you, you can park in this, my extra spot if they only have one car there. Yeah. I guess that would be, but if they had two cars there, I'd have to go someplace else. Right. Okay. Correct, yeah. <clears throat> There's been a proposal, and I don't know how it dovetails in with your project. Uh, yeah, I think it's put together between the county and the conservancy about a, a walkway going parallel to the mm -hmm. lake shore, and it would kind of go in front of your place, and I'm not exactly sure. I was looking at a map I have here that I got last week at the conservancy meeting. And I, yeah. And it, uh, are you basically supporting that, or is that? Well, most definitely. And uh, the, the promenade or the Kings Beach board, boardwalk, right. it's kind of flip-flopping between names, that, that came out of a Kings Beach visioning uh, exercise that the community went through. Uh, both myself and Bill Johnson attended that and were part of those meetings. And the idea is to link the east side of Kings Beach to the west side with a boardwalk type feature. Mm -hmm. Brockway Vista Avenue, since it's public property, is, is kind of what everyone has their eyes on. Uh, Todd Davidson, the investor, he's well aware of that potential of that project. We've told staff that we're supporters of that project. 
We'd like to work together with them. Uh, we feel there's some unique opportunities with the Boardwalk Project, not just in front of the Peak 10 Project, but uh, moving west through the Ferrari property as well. Uh, so we're supporters. We know it's out there. Uh, we've discussed potentially having a disclosure when it comes time to sell the units that we disclose that that uh, project is out there as well. I'd like to take it clear over to the parcel in front of the Safeway and go all the way, there, yeah. All the way across. To yeah. That would be a tremendous improvement I think it'd be for Kings nice. Beach, yeah. Actually, it could be a loop. We could make a loop out of it and go down the highway and then back on the shoreline or whatever, so. Yeah, or loop back through the business district. <clears throat> that too, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One Idiot. more question, go if ahead. I could, and, and I don't know, for, for you, for fellow, why, why no boat or personal watercraft or trailer parking? If you've got two vehicles and two spaces, what's, what's the difference? times at that one one per unit so um, we were concerned that potentially there could be several boat trailers there or other watercraft that you know be just taking up parking spaces which they have a limit on so we recommended no boat uh, kayaks or anything in those stalls and then the obviously the applicant has rationale what what their thoughts are and, and that's what we're staff's looking for direction well, from you and I think what we would say is we mostly agree with that condition, and, I, and we understand the genesis. I think it's not hard to uh, envision. We just talked about you know emergency access. Think about a 20-foot, 26-foot boat on a trailer, someone trying to pull into this site. We think that's where staff was coming from with that comment, and we recognize that. The, the part of the comment why I say we mostly agree is we'd like for smaller uh, trailers to be at the discretion of the owners there. Uh, someone that wants a kayak on a trailer, someone that can't lift it uh, on top of their car if they want to use a small trailer for a personal uh, human-powered kayak or, or stand-up paddleboard, we think there, there should be some flexibility there. I would actually like to ask the commission for the opportunity for us to negotiate with staff on revising that condition so that we can allow smaller type trailers on site. So when you say smaller, what, what's the length that you're thinking of? And we're, we're thinking something less than 16 feet, somewhere in that realm. But I, but I think instead of talking specifics today, what I'd like to ask for is the opportunity to revise that condition with staff and include it in our CCNRs so that we can provide a, a kayak type or paddleboard type trailer on site. I'd like to make a comment on this one. Um, I have a small travel trailer. It's a, it's a 17 foot model, but it's actually only 15 foot. I tow it with a, with a Highlander V6. And looking at the restrictions in there, I don't think it would be safe to pull in there and try and move it around or try and back it up. Mm. I mean, I, I just can't see where even a short one would be safe to try and pull it in alone, the, the parking restriction. Because I've, I've been in spots, I mean, I can get my thing, my little guy in, in a lot of spots, but when you have it, and my car isn't a big old truck, it's a, you know, a Highlander. And um, it, it just, it, it's, that's really tight. I mean, I've been in, I've been in tight spots with it where, where I go camping, and that's the advantage of having a small trailer, but that I wouldn't recommend it. And if you pulled in, how would you back it in? I just don't see how that would even be possible. I understand what you're saying, but it doesn't seem like it would be very safe, alone the parking. You know, and I think we're all nodding our heads on that, but what we're concerned with is that specific language of 43. Well, what's it say for example? It says no boat, no personal watercraft and or trailer storage is permitted. So does boat seems broad, does that include a, a kayak or other human powered type vessel, a stand-up paddle board. I think if it's on a trailer, I mean, it's going to have to have a certain size trailer, even a small watercraft, even the ones that are skidoos or whatever, they have them on those shorter trailers. I even see those as an issue as far as the safety. I'm talking just a, just a safety aspect. I understand what you're saying, but anyway. Could we ask? That's, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That, that prohibition doesn't, isn't intended to keep people from bringing things in on the, t the car top carrier type thing. Not, not at all. 
it'd be the independent DMV trailer, the prohibition on that is what we're looking at. Now, there, at one time, there was a, I think the guy across the street that has the, the old gas station mm -hmm. is coming through here. Is that? That's the Falcon. That was yeah. the Falcon. Well, I realize that. Yeah. Is that that's severed now? It's no longer going to continue, or do we know? Uh, sorry, I don't understand the question. Well, he was using this site to launch all his boats from the across the street. Reynolds. Oh, the Reynolds from the. I think that's next door. It's either Steamers yeah, or at the Falcon. Yeah. I don't as believe well as, Sun and Sand ever had a permit for. As well as at Dave's with Phil Siegel. Yeah. He has a spot there for the Reynolds across the street on the mountain. Right, side. and he was coming through here launching. Uh, watercraft and stuff. You know, to the best of my knowledge, it wasn't through this parcel. Uh, Dave's is about here, or the, the Tahoe Paddle and in the summer, and I believe they had access through the Steamers parking lot. Steamers also has a small jet ski and kayak concession here, and then the Falcon is kind of to the top of the page. Maybe it was a Falcon. I, yes. I believe they were accessing through there. I think that's what their permit stated. Sorry. Uh, Alan, I wanted to ask you about what he's suggesting about negotiating with you about having a non-vehicle parking there, and if it was like fifth, if you said a maximum of 15 feet, you know, from the tow point to the back. I mean, before we say that might be okay with us, I'd like to find out where staff is if that's something you'd be receptive to. If if I could jump in first, uh, one thing we really need to caution you of or look at is environmental do environmental document and. And when it talks to the variance, it speaks to vehicle parking. Uh, so I don't think there's an analysis of whether or not we even looked at trailer parking at that time. Uh, that, that brings up a whole different, uh, you know, parking and circulation issues, safety issue. Uh, those parking stalls are angled, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they're 90 degrees. They're, they're, they are 90 degrees. Yeah. 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 Uh, well then, you're saying at this point, unless we want to kind of blow this whole thing up, we really can't change this. Yeah, I don't believe the analysis is there in the in the environmental document. Right. Is there is further environmental analysis warranted just for a, a owner's use decision on the stall? I think that's something we would have to look at, and you know, when we, maybe when we do look at the CCNR, see what what would be acceptable. If you, know, you have the 20 foot stalls and a lot of your, you know, I mean, we're talking about vehicle trail. I mean, most of your boat trailers, you know, the, they go beyond 20 feet beyond the size of a parking stall, correct? So I think what you're talking about are the, you know, smaller, more personal type watercraft, whether it's canoes or kayaks or, mm. or jet skis. I mean, that's something. Well, I, I don't know. I guess in my mind, I'm thinking something where if they pulled in, they could go by hand, unhook it, and wheel it in by hand mm -hmm. would be the maximum that I would think that you'd even consider. Because if it's something like Rich was saying with, with his, you're not going to be able to disconnect it. You're going to have to back it in with the vehicle. You know, it's... What condition was that? It's number 43. 43. The, the other suggestion we had on that condition, <laughs> the potential of inserting the word motorized, so no motorized boat personal watercraft and or trailer parking storage is permitted. That would, that seems to us to not limit folks that are doing the human powered sports, which we're really trying to encourage in Kings Beach. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I just don't think the, the mitigated neg deck, you know, analyzed trailers being parked there. It was, it was strictly, strictly vehicles. There's no, for, for parking stalls, and correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, I mean, you can drive in there, park in the space, you can back out, but you can't drive in. Can, is there a, a, adequate turnaround towards the back for a vehicle, maybe, with a trailer? Maybe the idea here is to just go ahead and approve it as it is and then bring it back as another item sometime when you get together with staff and they can because if we approve it without addressing yeah, it, yeah. The environmental document, then you're worse off than if we did nothing. So right. that needs to be addressed somehow anyway. So I think it'd be better to bring it back as a separate item when you've worked out exactly the kind of vehicles you're going to tolerate. Uh, uh, Larry, there is a couple of. Um, can you please just just state your name? Oh, Bill Johnson. Record. Okay, Bill. 
if you look at the way the parcel expands, it expands 25% on the, the area right here. So there is some area in there for a small, small trailer for a car to actually drive in and back. I mean, we have dumpsters, containers, heavy equipment in there right now, and we've been able to witness that. Not in the first portion, say the first 125 feet, but the portion from where that angle point is right there, from there up to there, gives us a little bit of room to maneuver. But I still don't think we can do anything today on you that. Right, it's change. 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 Right. Yeah. at some point. Right. Commissioners, uh, let me tell you the concern I, I share also with EJ about the environmental document. The variance was to reduce the amount of parking, and what the NEGDEC did is it looked at what the project description was, which was the parking for those condominium units. Now, if, for example, you have several of these units to decide to use one of their two parking spaces for, for boat storage of any sort, then there is the potential of impacts related to where other cars will go, circulation, the parking. None of that was looked at within the environmental document. It's not to say there is an impact, but it would not be prudent to go forward and ignore that fact. I like kind of question the wisdom of uh, encouraging, or not encouraging, but allowing boats and et cetera to be parked in a redevelopment area downtown. I mean, it's, it's, you're trying to get people down. Now, it's not going to be a boat storage area. I know you're not going to make it boat storage. It might only be one in there. I understand that. But I agree with what council was saying. But I also just think from a, a visual standpoint, we're trying to improve the area, not <laughs> so we have enough boat storage in Roseville that <laughs> shouldn't be done uh, out in front and whatever. But anyway, that is my comment. And, and I think we understand that, I th you know, where this condition lies, you know, and how we view it is that it's, it's just a slightly trending towards some success limiting criteria. And, and the motorboats and the large trailers, I think we completely agree and we understand the genesis of why that condition's in there. So I want to make sure that you guys aren't thinking that we're saying, hey, we don't, we don't get or understand this condition at all. That's not the case. We, we do understand why it's there. Uh, our concern is that we have this new development right on the beach. We want people to be able to enjoy it. And on one end of that spectrum, someone might argue that's a large boat and a large trailer. We're not at that end of the spectrum. We're over here saying, what about a small stand-up paddleboard? What about a kayak? You know, if you look at this unit where it's located, we can assume that some of those items will be on site. And we want to make it available to people to be able to have those and go enjoy the lake and show Kings Beach as an active, vibrant town. And, and that's, that's kind of where we're, we're asking, maybe not for the solution today, but for the ability to resolve it, potentially in our CCNRs. And, and that's why I asked for that, could we insert that word, no motorized boat, uh, into the condition, and, and leave the options for kayaks and human-powered sports available? Or do we have to come back and, and try, to, try to work through that in more detail? I was hopeful that we could. I, I I, I guess as a suggestion, I mean, I hear a lot of things you're saying, and it makes a lot of sense. And I think what you are going to find is people are going to bring their kayaks up and their and their uh, paddle boards, and they're going to probably be attached right on top of their vehicle, not on a on a trailer. So you'll probably see a lot of that. We aren't preventing that, but to 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 allow vehicle or I mean trailer right. parking. Uh, with a mitigated neg deck that we have, I think we have to we do have to go back and look at that. And I think that's something staff can work with you after the fact on this project to figure out it, you know, you know what what exactly are you looking for? We can look at turnaround and safety. Are, are people going to have to back into the highway to back up their boat if they get in there and they can't get out? A lot of issues that were never analyzed, and we're happy to look at that with you and see what options there are. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think this is a, a, a closed deal. I think we just have to uh, look at it, analyze it, and then see what the process is to, to uh, you know, get you where you want to be. I think Let me once, question, you, once, question, you, oh. once you get the project well underway and near completion, I think staff can come up and meet with you and look at that wing piece, and maybe if you have just light trailers with like a small sailboat or something on them, and they can be put back in where the dumpsters are and stuff without interfering with the rest of the people, uh, then staff could bring back a recommendation for a 
change in, well, in this as it is. That's probably the easiest way to deal with it once it's. I mean, the, yep. the other option, is, uh, um, which is on the table, is if the applicant wants to continue this matter to discuss this condition further, which may lead to an additional environmental analysis, or it may not. Uh, it's a matter of really sitting down and looking at it. <clears throat> that is the other option. Well, but yeah. <laughs> I'm just posing it out that well, we have one of two options here. Actually, one thing, even if you eliminated the trailers completely, is like a, they have storage areas, you know, just the frames where if you have a stand up paddle board, where, you know, looking on site, if you have dumpsters there and stuff where it's low profile you've got the deck out there some somewhere where you know they turn mm -hmm. the paddleboard sideways and and then they have kayaks and stuff you see them you see them all over where you can get if you only have 10 units and everybody has one or two paddle boards i mean it doesn't take up more than probably a 15 by 20 foot area where you can get a lot of that stuff if they're stacked too high you get a lot more in <laughs> yeah because I, I see us getting into the trailer deal, trying to set something up, and actually with the all the stuff that we have here today, if we want it approved, let's get yeah and, you know, work and on this, and then then you can move forward with staff later. Right, and, and maybe as an idea too, Andrew, just thinking out what was mentioned, it could be part of the HOA. Maybe it's an amenity. Maybe it is a kayak, a canoe that's stationed maybe on the deck where it's not a trailer that's associated with it and the trailer goes to a legal site and then you, the residents have an amenity for everyone that can be there that could be non-power that you can use and we can approve that through these conditions through the CCNRs when we work with you maybe that's an option too no and I, and I just yeah. thank you for the discussion and I, and I understand I understand where everyone's leaning Okay. Well, for some of this stuff, I guess, uh, are, are the units each going to have a storage, some kind of storage tank for skis and that kind of thing? They, they do. They each have a small closet that is exterior, and then they have full closets and plenty of storage space inside. And so the, these storage spaces wouldn't be large enough, though, for like a paddleboard? Uh, a paddleboard would most likely be stored on the deck. The deck of the unit upstairs? Cor mean, correct, yeah. Yeah. Okay, looks like answered all the questions. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat> okay, is, is that it? Okay, anybody from the public like to say anything on this issue? Seeing none, I'll close it off and bring it back to the commission for comments or motion. Alan, would you mind putting up what you want us to approve, please? Good for everybody else to see what we're doing. Yeah. Oops. Oops. That's yours. That's right. Thank you. There you go. Are you ready for a motion, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I sure am. Okay, I'm going to move that we approve the project with the following conditions and considerations. Number one, adopt a mitigated negative declaration and mitigated monitoring program prepared for the project. Do you want these individually or can we do them collectively? Individually or collectively? Well, you want to get them. One, I would, one at a time or all of them? Okay. Yeah. That's, that's I, would, I would do them all together yeah. and then also uh, keep in mind the errata yeah, sheet okay, that you would have good. to approve as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, secondly, approve the. T Vesting tentative map, subdivision map, and conditional use permit to allow up to 10 single family residential airspace condominiums units. And three, approve the variance to allow 20 on site parking spaces for the Peak 10 project. And also to consider the, the uh, errata sheet and include that information as well. So is that good enough? Did you include you findings in the there? Errata? No, you don't need to read, read the errata. Did you include findings? Yeah. Supported by findings? Then you're good. Is there a second? <laughs> okay, have a motion second. Roll call. Mr. Sedison? Yes. 
Mr. Moss? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Ricucci? Yes. Mr. Denial? Yes. Okay, motion passes. If anybody wants to file an appeal, they have 10 calendar days and the appeal fee is $552. Thank you for, for that. We yeah, we'll have fun knocking your building down. Try to figure out the yeah. best way to deal with the trailers <laughs> yeah. later. <laughs> Want to take a, Good luck. a quick five minute break yeah, and fun. we'll be right back for our second item. Like you're yes, up thank again. you. Yeah. Up again. Um, this particular project, uh, it does require a re subdivision. It's seven ind independent lots. It's our typical 25 by 125 lots. Uh, it's located in Kings Beach. This is the site right on Trout. Um, and to make it clear, it is in the staff report just for public knowledge as well as the commission. It's regulated by... Uh, HCD, which is the state. It used to be a mobile home park. So there's modulars that came into this particular location. So the environmental review is very specific to the, uh, the map uh, that they were looking for to redraw these seven independent lot lines. And I want to make sure it's clear too. Initially, when staff reviewed it, we were looking at a variance because they were reducing the non conforming lot sizes. <clears throat> but because they're not reducing it further, it would not require a variance. They're maintaining the existing non-conforming sizes of the 2,500 square feet. So I just want to make sure that's clear. That was initially in the public noticing, but the staff report, uh, we're just looking for the tentative uh, map, not the variance to lot size. Um, but because it's HCD2, some of the questions you had on the previous project is setbacks, parking, um, we don't regulate this under the state law. The, the state has their own building permits, their own setbacks, their own parking. So this particular site is already developed. It was developed back in 2005 with these modular structures and they were built over the lot lines. So the applicant uh, came to us and said that they want to redraw these lines and be able to sell them off independently. So that's what you have before you today is just for uh, approval by the commission is the redraw of these lot lines. So to get everyone oriented, it is in what we call the grid of Kings Beach. Um, it's right in the center of it. It's zone residential. It meets the density. This is the proposal of going around the existing modular buildings that are here. There is one lot line would go through two garages here, but again, that's up to see uh, the HCD uh, to, from the state to regulate uh, that requirement through the building. This is what the easement exhibit is as well that you have in front of you. The, the existing site is mentioned. Uh, it was improved. It does have TRPA approvals. Um, this one took a while for us to get it in front of the Planning Commission. There was a lot of discussion from the fire district as well as the public utility district because it was already built. They had to come up with uh, requirements on their end because there's no building permits, no improvement plans to the county. They had to independently work with the applicant to get those things addressed. That's why this project has been taking so long. Some of the criteria too sh the commission should know of is notification of the tenants. There is language in the staff report. Per the subdivision map law, we have to be able to notify, or actually the applicant has to notify the tenants ensuring that uh, they're aware of this re-subdivision uh, so they have the opportunity to purchase as well. So that's disclosed in the staff report. And with that, it's pretty straightforward. This project is only to redraw the existing seven lot lines. And if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer it. I do have the applicant here as well, but we are looking for adoption of the mitigated neg deck and the approval of the tentative subdivision map. I see, uh, yeah, these actually look like houses yes at what point does the uh, state uh, lose interest in regulating these particularly since they're being divided into individual parcels uh, good question they, because it initially was a uh, mobile home park um, they have the regulatory ability to to approve structures there and trailers uh, because of the state they trump the county with regards to those entitlements um, 
I've seen one time since I've been with Placer County, there was another trailer park, actually two, there was Stoker's as well as uh, John Stafford's um, that we had, they relinquished control and gave it directly to the county. So then we were able to regulate what was able to be built on those two sites. This specific one, the HCD is still gonna be regulating it um, on their end. They're not, they're not gonna relinquish it to the county. And so the property owner just has an elected to uh, go to the state and ask to be removed from that process? I'll, I'll let him okay. answer that question. <clears throat> well, the, the originally is, was seven lots, is that yes, correct? That's and, correct. They, and they built these units across these lot lines, evidently. Correct. I don't know why they would have done that, but anyway. <laughs> um, and so now just reconfiguring, so it's still seven and seven. That's correct. So they can each can have their own space or they can be sold. That, that's the individual one before they couldn't be sold because they the lots were still there if they would have built them properly in those days uh, it, then they could have sold them off individually because they are individual lots right that's correct Kings Beach is you know it's as mentioned here in 1926 when it was originally subdivided you were it, there it was 25 foot by 125 foot uh, lots and they were mainly for uh, summer use you know for camping <laughs> and whatnot so over the years, you know, people have built over these these lot lines. Um, there's quite a few of them in Kings Beach. It's it's very typical, if you will. Uh, so our anytime we get a building permit or something, we we try to clean this up, do voluntary mergers, lot line adjustments to make sure that they meet requirements in the current code. Okay, thank you. I think there is a exception in the ordinance to build a 17 foot cabin on a 25 foot lot wasn't that the way it was at one time yeah, yeah and it, no floors I mean I, I've seen some with dirt floors some cabins out there and it's it gets very unique you know that's for sure but it, it's a lot of improvements in Kings Beach I mean because of the core project it's really energizing a lot of the community out there they don't look bad they look presentable and the new lot lines will be wrapped around the buildings appropriately, I guess, huh? That's correct, and that's what we're looking, staff's recommending to, um, to the commission, okay. just that. Because you, as you can see here, this is the existing modulars and the new lot lines coming down in here, you know, independent. As Richard was saying, too, that's, that's what you have here before you is to make sure that they're able to sell off those particular lots with the structure on it. Are these modulars on concrete foundations, or are they on... Yours. I'll let the applicant discuss a little bit more with that because, again, right. it's not under county review. Thank you. you bet. Well, just one quick question. Who, who maintains the entrance road here? I mean, it's now that it's you. not. I mean, is that a, is that a county road there? Or? There's no. a, sorry. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, Rebecca Tabor, Engineering and Surveying. It, there, there was an encroachment permit issued by Placer County for the encroachment to Trout Avenue some time ago, actually. So it is a county maintained road, on trout. Site. but the on site, that would be the HOA, that's private. Why they have an HOA there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, that, that, that's fine. Thanks. Okay. Good morning, my name's John Anderson. I'm the project owner and developer and here to answer any of your questions. You're not the one that built over those lot lines, are you? Yes. The <laughs> lot line issue. Have, you don't have to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So just a quick thing on the lot lines. The state, under their park rules, has their own lot line rules. Mm -hmm. And this was, lot lines were approved by the state before we did this construction. They're trying to build more of a community as opposed to the, the long, narrow uh, process. I see, so you, uh, you currently own all these uh, part, uh, about to be parcels? Yes, that's You're correct. The owner. Okay. Yeah. So ultimately you'll have the chance to sell it. I guess maybe what my question is uh, <clears throat> why why are you continuing with the state on as a trailer park? Because the buildings look like they're regular houses or the foundation. That's very true and uh, it's an interesting thing that's happening across the state right now. Um, uh, trailer parks are changing. You don't see them there and in fact the standard trailer you see is actually illegal in Tahoe because of the snow loads. The uh, requirements now that any trailer installed around Tahoe has to be meet these very strict snow load requirements, have to have strict foundations. And uh, this is a process that's happening around and um, the, 
it's really hard to tell a difference. I guess the only really difference you see is whether they're ma manufactured as a modular or a factory versus stick build. Obviously, it's nicer than it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and tenants are very happy, and uh, at least two of the tenants are interested in purchasing. But, and so now you'll be able to sell these as you get new lot lines individually to whomever you... That's correct. And there will be a, a, an HOA which would uh, owners would have to take care of the common properties. Okay. Uh, does the state require you to... Was this built under a low-cost program where you have to get cer certain standards or are you, are you free to do as you choose? <coughs> no, there's states with very strict rules. They have their own inspectors, had to go through their process. And uh, one of the changes, the physical, there's, the only physical changes that we're doing right now is the water department wants us to put in separate water meters. So my next step will be getting the state to approve that because anything that happens has to go through their process as well, uh, physically, the separate water meters. Will this stay under the state's program forever, or will it eventually come back to the county now that it's a lot in block? Well, <laughs> who knows? My my thought is it'll probably stay in the state forever. Yeah, and that's the no intention of ever changing that. Okay, is it? Do they pay when someone buys one of those from the state? Do they then pay taxes? And does it come to the county? Is yes, that's correct. They pay does. property taxes, absolutely. Both on the land and the yes, and the building improvements. Mm -hmm. So this is considered affordable housing. Is it under some kind of program for that? No, it's not. Okay. So, because I don't know whether there's some uh, requirements for this area to have a certain level of affordable housing. And this looks like it might be something that could qualify just because of the size of the structures. But I don't know what your price range is on those. Yeah, there's no affordable housing requirement on this project. That gets into rent control and sales yeah. requirements and stuff. And I think a lot of people try to avoid that if they can. Okay, any other questions? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody in the public that would like to comment on this project? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and bring it back to the commission for discussion or motion. Thank you, Alan. If you're ready, Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion. Go ahead. I move that, number one, we adopt a mitigated negative declaration and mitigated monitoring program prepared for the project, and two, approve the tentative subdivision map to allow seven existing non-conforming lots to be non reconfigured to allow for individual manufactured home ownership. Do we have a second? second? That? And that would be subject to the findings and conditions. I'm sorry? Sub subject to the findings and conditions set forth okay. in the staff report. Thank you. Now I second that. Okay. I have a motion to second. You can roll call. <laughs> Get her. Mr. Sevison? Yes. Mr. Great. Mr. Moss? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yeah. Mr. Ricucci? Yeah. Mr. Denial? Yes, motion carries. If anybody would want to appeal, they have 10 calendar days and the appeal fee is $552. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll move to our number three item, flood protection, Placer County General Plan Amendment, negative declaration. And Nikki? Good morning, Nikki Street. Actually, good afternoon, right? We're fast approaching afternoon. Um, Nikki Street in Planning Services Division. Uh, I am here today to present a general plan amendment for flood protection uh, that is guided by state legislation and affecting every city and county in the state of California. Uh, this morning, I'll, little, I'll be talking a little bit about the background and purpose behind what's being proposed. 
uh, the legislative requirements, um, the proposed changes, or an overview of the significant proposed changes and the impact on our communities. Uh, as you know, flooding um, can cause a significant amount of destruction in terms of economic assets and um, loss of life, and a variety of events in the state of California have happened in the last 30 years, predominantly impacting um, the Central Valley, uh, but also the issue is sort of elevated with um, nationwide um, flooding events like Hurricane Katrina and so forth, and that's kind of where all of this is stemming from. This this has raised concern to proactively address the issue of flooding in the state. The reason, as I mentioned before, why staff developed uh, these amendments is because the California State Legislature passed a number of bills that required local agencies to begin acknowledging the connection between land use and flood management. Uh, the, the general plan sort of being that main tool uh, that drives land use and future development. Uh, the package of legislation, as I mentioned, um, really looks at general plan changes, but it also brings uh, to light this um, new idea of an urban level of flood protection, and uh, that, that is uh, called out, defined, and refined through a number of processes in the legislation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Uh, so the look at, looking at the legislative requirements, um, there was a package of about six interrelated flood management bills that were passed in 2007, 2008 uh, that we are required to comply with. Additionally, um, the county is in what's called the Sacramento San Joaquin Drainage District, largely based on a flood protection facility that we have in, um, along the Bear River in the north well, actually, south southwestern corner up towards past Sheridan, up in that corner, that qualifies us um, uh, to to sort of participate in some above and beyond requirements for other parts of the state. Uh, so, consultation with the Central Valley Flood Protection Board was required for us. We submitted our safety element to that agency for review and received no comment. Um, as I mentioned before, the urban level of flood protection is this big piece of the legislative requirements. Um, and just to, you know, to cover the definition for that, uh, it determines protection that is necessary to withstand flooding uh, that has a one in 200 chance of happening in any given year. So it's a half percent chance in a year. This next slide takes a look at the criteria um, under which a project is subject to the urban level of flood protection. And there are five criteria. A project is subject to the urban le level of flood protection when it meets all five of these. So it has to be located within the Sacramento-San Joaquin Valley, and essentially everywhere in Placer County west of the Sierra Nevada Crest meets this, this criteria. It has to be located in an urban area with 10,000 residents or more. It has to be located within a flood hazard zone in a FEMA map, uh, in an area with potential flood depth above three feet, and then in a watershed with a contributing area of more than 10 square miles. So we'll kind of take a look at what, what that looks like. Um, from a cross-section standpoint, you can see here um, the, the normal stream channel here on the bottom the limits of the 200-year and 100-year floodplain, and then this sort of key piece of criteria, which is a flood depth of three feet that's measured from the 200-year floodplain uh, to where you see this three-foot mark, that's actually where the urban level of flood protection lies. It's this hatched area in the middle. Um, you'll, you'll notice in this example that the urban level of flood protection is actually contained within the 100-year floodplain. Uh, and Placer already regulates to its 100-year floodplain through participation in FEMA's federal um, na national insurance, um, na national flood insurance program. So technically, we already protect to this level. This is another graphic, just looking in terms of a plan view. You can see um, the, the light blue 
is what shows the limits of the 100-year floodplain. Just outside of that in the dark blue line is the 200-year floodplain. And then, of course, the urban level of flood protection, which is measured from that, again, key criteria, three-foot depth from the 200-year uh, that's shown um, in the hatched or dotted area. Uh, based on staff's analysis, in almost all in instances in Placer County, the urban level of flood protection will be within that 100-year floodplain boundary, and then uh, therefore just subject to standards that we are, we're already uh, imposing on projects. So looking at some of the actual amendments, um, we have uh, made to the land use, natural resources, health and safety, and public services and facilities elements. Uh, the first three were actually required by the legislation. Um, the public services and facilities element for Placer County, uh, it actually, we have a flood protection section. So in order to keep the entire general plan consistent uh, with itself, we made updates there as well. Uh, biggest change being instead of uh, referencing protection to the 100-year floodplain, we um, have defined something called the county regulatory floodplain, and that uh, term now uh, includes the 100-year floodplain and the urban level of flood protection. Uh, we've also tightened up some of the language referencing our stormwater management programs, again, something we're already doing but was reinforced by the legislation. Um, the safety element, um, emphasizes partnership with um, other agencies in the state. Again, something we're already doing, but the legislation was encouraging uh, some policy language on that, um, as well as uh, the safety element now includes procedures for development review if a project is located in the urban level of flood protection. Um, some other significant uh, proposed changes are the, uh, the inclusion of an implementation program to map and identify um, some of these new areas. Uh, staff actually has a handful of maps, or we have some maps on hand, but um, there are a few key areas in the county that we have not mapped. And between our flood district and the Department of Public Works, uh, we have a, an implementation program um, written here that uh, will we'll bring that forward. Um, we've added some new additions to the glossary, as you'll see in your packet. Uh, and then I thought it was worth mentioning that um, this amendment comes to you without modification of land use designations, uh, the land use map, or the capital improvement plan. And then in looking at the anticipated impacts, um, as I've, I've, pardon me, as I've mentioned, changes uh, acknowledge existing regulation and existing floodplain information. So the changes are or the impacts rather are quite minimal. Um, flood protection at the 100 year level will continue to be regulated. Uh, existing land use, zoning, and restrictions on development will continue to guide safe development. Uh, based on the location criteria that um, I mentioned, uh, the amendment poses a pretty small departure from how we regulate uh, the floodplain already. <coughs> and the base flood elevation for the 100 year will continue to set the standard for the most part. In terms of impact to development and project applicants, our bigger projects like specific plants and subdivisions will be required in the short term to do some mapping. In fact, um, Rick might be able to speak to um, a specific plan project that we have already in house that you know, where the developer and the applicant has done that work for us knowing that this is upcoming. Um, and then small development projects like a single family home that are uh, in the floodplain, we aren't expecting to do mapping. That's <coughs> kind of an onerous thing to have them do. Uh, and staff is planning to support that analysis, analysis <coughs> of some of the data we, we have um, uh, and, and work with them on that. Uh, a neg deck was prepared for this uh, general plan amendment um, for the most part, uh, well, in total, no impact or less than significant impacts were noted just because there's not a physical change to the environment happening. Um, so uh, with that, the recommendation today is to forward 
this recommendation to the Board of Supervisors, which is to adopt the NEG deck um, and adopt a resolution approving amendments to the Placer County General Plan. And okay. that's all. I'm available for questions, oh. and I'll probably rope, rope Rick Erie into this okay. also. Okay. <laughs> how I understand, you know, how this would impact new development because they can adapt to it. But how about existing, um, whether it's commercial or residential, where they fall in the, that 200 year? Or so all these years they've been out of a floodplain area and all of a sudden they're dumped into it. How does, how does that affect them? So um, something that's just, if the, if the project is being proposed outside, you know, outside of the 100 year, but within the 200 year, it's actually, it's actually not subject to these requirements. Um, really this hatched area is what we're looking at. So a development, a commercial project, or a home that was approved within our 100-year existing, and I may kick this over to you, Rick, um, probably was either, uh, well, according to our, our existing land uses, it probably, it, it wasn't, um, it was set aside already as a flood hazard area or, or open space or whatever it may be, um, or it was subject to whatever um, standards we put on projects. Um, that are in a floodplain, but like elevating the structure and so oh, forth. Okay, but I'm, I'm talking about it. You're talking about existing, because I'm talking about existing, because in that narrow band that you have up, up there, of course, with those contours, you know, it, it's pretty extreme, but a lot, of, a lot of areas in the county are pretty flat, and you, you don't realize a, a, a foot or so mm -hmm. difference on that can make a big difference over a lot of potential acreage and stuff where there's residential or it could be commercial or whatever. And I was just wondering what's the, the impact to existing development? I mean, other than, what is it, just their insurance probably goes up because they're in a floodplain now? <laughs> um, uh, Rick Gary with Engineering and Surveying. I can probably try to clarify that. So. The, actually, the flatter the floodplain is, the less impactive this will be to existing developments because we need to focus on that hatched area where the water is three feet deep from the 200-year water surface down to the ground. So as, as your ground gets flatter, that depth gets shallower, so you're not going to run into that urban level of flood protection for existing projects. So even if we mapped out 200-year floodplains um, throughout the county, uh, we're, we're going to find that existing developments will not be subject to the ULOP, which is that shaded area. Where it may come into play is actually when your stream banks are more vertical and you get a three-foot depth at the edge of the 200-year floodplain, which is outside of the 100-year floodplain. But in, even in that point, you're not going to get a very big increase in the floodplain delineation. So it's, it's a little difficult to try to explain this because it's all based on the 200-year floodplain, but the impact is only based on that portion of the 200-year floodplain that is three feet or deeper. And all our 100-year floodplains go out to zero. And so we regulate currently to the 100-year floodplain, which goes out you know, to zero where that three foot depth where the 200 year floodplain would be is almost always within that 100 year floodplain limit. Does that help, Chairman? <laughs> the answer is no, sir. the answer for you and I is no. I think I understand it. <laughs> I understand the concept. The only reason I brought it up because actually on, on this issue, it, it, I was talking to a farmer that lives out uh, in North Placer County way out and and it's affected his farming practices a little bit at least according to him from the state level and stuff because he wasn't very happy you know he couldn't use the land like he he wanted to so oh. and I don't know I didn't you know this j just hearing this presentation that's why I was was wondering how 
my guess is uh, existing operations. Yeah, my guess is that most of the folks that have heard about this legislation uh, are confused because they're thinking that it's the 200-year flood plain that they're going to be regulating, but in essence, it's not. It's only the portion of the 200-year flood plain that's three feet deep or greater within typically a 100-year flood plain or a FEMA flood plain. So we tried to provide an exhibit that would help explain that. We knew it wasn't going to be crystal clear, but um, Hopefully, if uh, there's any more technical questions I can help out with, I'll be happy to. Okay. Uh, I have one more question. I'm looking here, uh, the page safety elements, flood hazards, and policies, um, 8B11. If any project, including the modification of an existing project, falls within the jurisdiction regulated, they'll need to get an encroachment. Define modification. I mean, if somebody comes in for a remodel building permit they're going to have to all, I mean how, what what's a modification where where are we going with this so um, if there is an existing structure within a FEMA regulated floodplain that's within a drainage shed of 10 square miles or greater that has a population area of 10,000 people or more these all have to come into play these all those findings of fact have to come into play and they want to remodel or more like not a remodel, but rebuild or add on to their existing structure, then they will likely fall into the ULOP requirements, which would mean that their finished floor of their new structure, where before it would have to be set one foot above the base flood elevation for the 100 year, would now be required to be set one foot above the 200 year elevation. Okay, but I, I think we need some, some more specific, you know, than just modification in there because that's open to too much interpretation oh like a road. kitchen remodel or something like that would not <coughs> yeah, apply somebody wants yeah. to put a new water heater in and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're hit with all this kind of you know i mean it's it's got to be a little more major if we're going to go that route we could do that or we could simply refer it to the flood damage prevention ordinance with which already explains the one foot of freeboard above the 100 year water surface elevation and then maybe that might help clarify that, as opposed to rewrite it in this ordinance. That's just an option. Yeah. I, Certainly it needs to be clarified. That, that sort of sounds like what his issue mm -hmm. w was, because he has structures and barns and stuff, and all of a sudden it's like, I, you know, if, if I go in to improve the wall or something, you know, I have to do all this, all this work. Good point. Okay, any other questions? Does this uh, change any setbacks? Does it? No change. Okay. Setbacks. They're, they're, you know. Oh, okay. Do any, any more discussion? Motion? <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion. Um, make a motion that the uh, Planning Commission forward a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors to adopt uh, a negative declaration has set forth in attachment B and two, adopt a resolution adopting amendments to the Placer County General Plan, plan has set forth in attachment A subject to the following findings from CEQA um, and uh, the uh, general plan amendments uh, that promote, or well, we need to go into that part where we at. Just that, just adopt the resolution. I would like the additional wording put in in that 8B to to reference those that criteria to clarify the modification. Right. Yes. Correct. Okay. I'll second that. I have a motion and second. Roll call. Mr. Sevison. Yes. Mr. Gray, he's absent. Mr. Moss? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Nader? Yes. Mr. Ricucci? Yes. Mr. Denio? Yes. Okay. Thank you all. And we'll see you next meeting.